We're talking Daryl Brooks 2.0. We're talking Jeffrey Dahmer 2.0, all rolled into one, and his name is Steven Lorenzo. He is one of Tampa's most notorious you-know-whats, and we are going to be discussing him today in this video. Hello, Sofa Squad, and welcome back to the sofa. That's the sofa back there with Mr. Roscoe P. Coltrane, our little mascot there. And today we're going to be discussing the case of Stephen Lorenzo. Now, what happened recently is he went up for sentencing. This has been one of Tampa's longest running trials, or cases, I should say, really not trials. Been one of the longest running cases. It's gone on for decades. I don't know if you would say justice was finally served. I think it was because at the very end of it, he tried to do some kind of reverse psychology. It was very bizarre, but whatever, we're going to talk about it. And the way we'll do that is we'll look at clips and we'll look at the case through these clips and the sentencing hearing and the actual sentence. Now, before we do all that, let's go ahead and make a warm self a welcome back there, Roscoe. Uh, we're going to talk about the company that I partnered up with today to make this video possible. Y'all welcome them to the old sofa. I recently partnered up with Factor and I want to tell you about it. If you follow me, then you know that I'm rolling into my super busy time with work and all the cases we follow. I really wanted an option to take the guesswork and planning it out of meal prepping and Factor has been as easy as one, two, three. The menus are updated weekly with over 27 meals and 34 add-on options. So you can pick your favorite meals or you can even let them craft your order based on your taste preferences and meal history. They even have offerings of you're looking to follow a keto, low calorie, or vegan and vegetarian lifestyle. Now, when I got my first box, I was all about the ground pork and cheddar chili mac. Factor meals arrive pre-prepared and ready to eat in two minutes or less. That's faster than ordering in, and you can even go through a drive through that quick. So if I'm on the go or on the way to work, running behind, whatever the case may be, I'll literally just grab one of these and tote it with me, and it has cut down on those last minute trips to the drive through on top of all that, Factor makes it possible for you to achieve your daily goals through nutritious, purposeful eating, ingredients with integrity, and dietitian approved. Now you're probably like, well, that all sounds great, Paul, but uh, how's it taste? Is it good? Well, it's absolutely wonderful. So far, each meal I've tried, I have thoroughly enjoyed. So not only do you have all the benefits that I've been telling you about, but you also have the taste. And also, I've been able to get two meals out of a lot of them. So go ahead, give them a try. Use my link or go to go.factor75.com and use code FACTORSE31936 for 50% off your first box. Again, use my link or go to go.factor75.com and use code FACTORSE31936 for 50% off your first box. In the early 2000s in Tampa, Florida, gay men were terrorized by a modern day boogeyman and his name was Steven Lorenzo. Steven would leave a trail of victims. He would eventually meet up with a co-defendant named Scott and the two were on a mission to violate the world according to their private AOL chat messages. This deadly pairing would result in at least two known victims who would actually lose their lives to these monsters, Jason Gelhaus and Michael Wachholz, and they would lose their lives in the most heinous of ways. Today, we're gonna to be looking at the case of Scott and Steven. We're going to be looking at how Steven would continue to humiliate and victimize his victims on the stand during his sentencing hearing, but also how he would then grovel with the judge to try and get the best possible treatment for the last years of his life, something he was not willing to give his victims. So first, let's talk about the victims, Jason Galehouse and Michael Wachholz. Uh, they would each fall victim to these monsters on back-to-back -back nights after they each visited the club 2606. This was in Tampa. Now, Galehouse was 26 years old. He grew up in Sarasota, and he moved to Tampa in like late 2003 to live with some friends. He worked as a florist. He was taking college classes to continue his career in interior design. So December 19th, 2003, he's going to go with some friends to a Christmas party and they get home kind of late, but then they're like, hey, let's go back out again. And so they head out to 2606. Now, Gilhouse ends up telling his friends at one point, he's like, hey, you know what? Go ahead, leave without me. You know, I'm going to hook up with these dudes. I'm going to head out with them. We're, you know, going to go do what we're going to do. However, he was never heard from 
again. Now the next night, Michael Wachholz went missing. Now according to his mother, when she described him, she said, he was my firstborn, light of my life, such a good kid. Michael was such a good kid, hands down. He wasn't perfect, but oh, did he have a heart. He was a friend to all. Now she also would talk about how her son decided to move the family to a dairy farm after he served in the military. And she also talked about how hard it was when he decided to move to Florida. He left them back in Missouri. Um, but obviously, you know, she would never expect what ended up happening to him. Now he would also end up losing his life to these two monsters again on the second night. Obviously too, this would send ripples through Tampa. You know, the gay community was like, there's, you know, somebody is out here taking people out left and right. This is two nights in a row. It did not go well. Now eventually police would question Scott. This is his co-defendant, Stephen's co-defendant. He would confess and tell how he would help lure these men to Steve's home and then he would describe the nightmarish things that they did to the men before and after their demise. Now, Steve was charged with the Big M charge in 2016. And the next year, he went to a Tampa courtroom and he, brace yourselves, he says that he is a sovereign citizen. And he said that the, uh, this is a fiction. This is corporate court. This is not real. If you watch the Daryl Brooks trial, you already know. Now, in typical fashion, you know, that we see people who represent themselves a lot of times, he bogs the court down, the courtroom down with filings. He makes a mockery of the victims who survived and took the stand as well as those that did not survive. And that brings us to today's video. Okay, we're going to be looking at several different clips. And what I wanted to do for these clips was look at this case through the eyes of the victims, the victim's family, but also through Stephen's eyes and how he is, you know, maintaining, composing himself in the courtroom, representing himself because it honestly sends chills down my spine. So in order to get a grasp on the absolute depravity of these crimes, let's first look at a clip of Scott when he's doing his plea deal and just hear what they have to say in the courtroom, as well as we're going to eventually hear what uh, one of the mothers of the victims has to say as well. Scott Schweikert pled guilty today to two counts of first degree murder for killing her son, 26 year old Jason Galehouse, and another man, Michael Wackholz. Schweikert says he and a friend, Steve Lorenzo, tortured, drugged, raped the men after leaving a Tampa nightclub in December of 2003. Now, after Scott's confession and pointing the finger at Stephen, obviously this leads the cops to them, and they will find a plethora of evidence on his computer. And I'm talking tons of pictures, chats between him and Scott. And these pictures are of the victims of other victims who survived. I mean, they were not shy, especially uh, Scott or Stephen, about documenting his crimes and having it on there. So again, let's listen now to the the mother of Jason just to hear exactly kind of what you can guess happened to him. Why did I want you to take a look at this picture? Mom Pam Williams is five foot nothing. And I hope you remember this because you're going to burn in hell for this. Today, in this Tampa courtroom, she stood 10 feet tall. I don't even have a grave, a body, or a tombstone. I have the city dump with my son ground up like hamburger meat in the dirt. Now, I'm not going to go into much more details on the exact thing that happened to him, but you can only imagine it. It's safe to say that these two men were the devil himself. But let's hear what his own defense attorney has to say about the crimes. All the facts taken together make it one of the most horrible cases I've ever dealt with. So you know how a lot of time defense attorneys try to play things off or like, you know, tone it down or whatever? Not this one. This one made no bones about being like, this is absolutely horrible. Now, like I said earlier, these cases would get dragged out for years. Judges would change and retire, come and go, you name it. But the one thing that didn't change was the search and hope for justice, but also the absolute evilness, remorsefulness, if I'm saying that right, and the pure depravity of Stephen. So what I want to do now is look at a few clips of Stephen talking to the judge, and this is in regard to what he is saying happened. Now I will say this, you might need to wear your headphones for this because the audio is messed up in some of these, and uh, it was a recording thing like at the courtroom, I think some of the microphones were messed up, but you know, just if you're watching this on a normal thing, just be sure to, you know, adjust accordingly if need be. I tried to tweak it. So let's go ahead and hear what Stephen says happened. 
Do you want me to go into a little? I, I won't go into gory details, but I, I appreciate that. Yes, okay. but I would like to know why. Okay. I was identified as being speaking with Mr. Uh, um, Gale House at the bar, and that's true. I didn't actually meet Mr. Gale House. Mr. Gale House had met another gentleman, the gentleman I invited back. Um, these two gentlemen, I did not know offhand. They, they were talking to Schweikert. I put this in one of my uh, filings with the court before. When, I, when they, they said they knew who I was, and then I realized who they were, and I said, okay, let's all go back to my house and we'll party and have a good time. Mr. Schweik, uh, Mr. Um, and we did all go back. We we're going to go in the hot tub. We we're going to do all that uh, going on. Um, and uh, at that time, Mr. Um, Galehouse, I get confused with the two. Mr. Galehouse agreed to want to do a, a, I don't want to tarnish the memory of this kid, um, but agreed to want to do a group thing. We did some drugs. Mr. Galehouse did fall in the garage and cut himself. He actually did do that. That kind of stopped the idea of doing a group gathering or group sex, if you want to call it that. So he was with, the other two guys were bondage masters. I was a bondage master. Scott Schweikert was, a, was a, um, a green. He wanted, he was a wannabe. So we went into the house. Mr. Galehouse agreed to be bound. He said he's been done this before wanted to do that so you want me to go into a little bit more no i i, I just wanted to know why they're okay. dead oh okay well this is the reason i'm going leading up to it i mean come on my god now i've had to edit some words out here but you can do the guessing now a couple of things that i want you to pay attention to in this first of all keep in mind because we're going to hear from some of the victims here in a minute the surviving victims um, keep in mind the picture he is painting. He is painting a very consensual, you know, we're going to get together. We're going to party. You know, he done this. This one has done this. We're, we're, you know, this is all this. We, you know, we're going to get in the hot tub. You know, he did ingest some substances. He did fall down. He has a story for everything like that kind of happened according to him. So just keep that in mind when we hear from one of the victims who survived and recounts the way his experience with this man went. And then you do the math on that. Now, also a couple of things. First of all, when he's talking about his co-defendant and he's like, he was green, you know, he was a wannabe. This is one thing this guy does. He takes these jabs at people. This is very familiar of uh, Daryl Brooks when it was like, this doesn't bother me. This is fine, but it does bother them and they're coming after them. Now, obviously, he's not going to like this co-defendant because the co-defendant turned him in. I get it, right? But you'll see how he takes these like passive aggressive jabs at him. Now, thirdly, and I forgot to mention this at the beginning of the video, but when we start talking about this world you know the the master and all this kind of the bondage stuff and all that you know this is not to sit here and shame if people are consenting and they're having fun and doing their thing so be it i do not believe that this was consenting at all i do not think that these were people and when i say these were people i'm talking about steven and his co-defendant <clears throat> that were doing this in a consensual everyone's on the same page way the evidence clearly points that steven and scott wanted to cause harm to others and they enjoyed that so while this third party might have been like hey you know what i'm willing to experiment with blank unfortunately he wasn't he was with very dangerous people right if it even went that way i would almost argue it probably didn't and he was you know drugged against his will to be quite honest uh, is what i probably think happened uh but just keep those things in mind as we continue to watch these clips also lastly and i swear i'll stop talking i love this judge because the judge literally has an attitude like we would like i don't want to know all this i want to know why you did this like stop blabbering why did you do this senseless act mr schweikert wanted to get some um experience so we allowed him to do some stuff on Mr. Galehouse. Now, I don't know if I should add this, but um, Mr. Schweiker wanted to have a video done of him having experience as a master he was trying, and I was videotaping it while I was doing this. Mr. Schweiker um, got carried away. He lost control. He did that once before on a meeting I had with on a, on a, a group thing we did together once before. 
and uh, scared the heck out of the other guy. But anyway, he lost control. The kids started to scream and get all upset. Um, we did the video. We put a gas mask on him because he did not want to be identified while being videotaped. So that's why the gas mask went on. Um, we realized that the kid was going to probably call the police on all of us. So we had a power and we said, this kid can't leave. He's going to identify all four of us. So that was why the decision was made. Okay, let's dissect that one a little bit. First of all, again, notice how he is shifting blame to his co-defendant Scott. You know, Scott wanted to do this. Scott got out, out of, you know, he went out of control. This is what happened. Now, earlier in the hearing, uh, this guy, Stephen, he does, he's like, I take accountability for this happened at the house. Yes, you know, I'm not denying this, right? Now, what you're hearing here is someone describing the most senseless, idiotic reason for doing this. And again, I'm sitting here and again, not knowing the rules to this world. And I'm thinking, okay, so you're sitting here saying this guy, Scott, wanted to get experience doing this thing with this person. And so you and this other person are like allowing him to do this. And the kid got, you know, he got out of control. He screamed, well, that's not, the, I thought there were safe words involved with this. This, the, I don't believe this is what I'm getting at, right? I don't believe this at all. I think he's completely lying. I think he is trying to pivot himself to look somewhat innocent. Now, remember, this dude's been in the big house for a while, right? These kind of crimes don't go over well at all, right? Honestly, kind of surprised he's alive. I mean, you know. So the fact that he's trying to blame it on Scott, uh, you know, alleviate himself and all this, but then he does say, yeah, you know what? We all have this powwow. We decide the kid can't leave the house. He's going to tell on us. And it will never, I will, I will never understand why these people, and by that, I mean these criminals who do these things, would sit here and in their mind say, we've harmed someone and they could go to the police and tell on us. So the next logical thing is to take the risk to do away with them and grind them up and spread them in a landfill. Why? I mean, it, it's just in this day and age, I'm not trying to say, well, 50 years ago, sure, that's a good answer. No, it never is, obviously. But I, I would never understand the logic ever. And I guess I'm not meant to. See where I'm coming from? Because he wound up hurting the kid. We didn't, it wasn't our intention to do that, but I don't think it was Mr. Schwenker's intention to do it, but he was green on what he was doing. And we left him to his own volition and he wound up hurting the kid in his lower extremities. Who are the other people that were there? I knew them. I knew who they were because of, because of a bondage masters. Um, and I realized who they were because there was a, there was a, a organization that, well, bondage master organization type thing. And I was part of that, but I never met them before. And when they told me they were, they, that's why they knew who I was. They said, we know who you are, but I didn't know who they were. And I said, okay, so come back. That's why I invited them back to the house. But I didn't know them, know them. I knew them. I know two names. I only know their first names because when you're in a, that type of club situation, you generally don't give out your last names. That's just not, it's, you meet, you greet, do you agree to provide additional information to authorities should they seek it? I don't have their names. The thing I have, I don't know how to contact them anymore. I remember one name was John. The other name was Chad or Chuck. I can't even remember. Chad or Chuck is the one that patched up Mr. Um, Galhouse's arm. And um, uh, what do you call it? Um, I don't know how far I should go with it. No. But... Uh, what do you call, I'm, I'm trying to be careful, <laughs> Some, but I don't know their names because after this happened, they split. After the body was... Again, this sounds like the most dangerous, careless, non-consensual situation ever. And this guy is so hung up on... I was a, a, a bondage master. You know, I was in a club. I didn't know their names, but they knew me. I mean, he loves this attention. And just like any typical narcissist, sociopath, whatever you want to call him, he's like getting off on this. But again, when he's like, oh, who are the other people there? Okay, so I only knew their names. Well, when we do this stuff, we don't really exchange names. I mean, I can see that part, right? But it's like, 
And you hear the judge, the judge ain't having it. Are you going to help, you know, prosecute this? Well, I don't know. You know, then why are you still blabbing your mouth? You know, why are you still blabbing your mouth? And we'll hear a little bit more when we get into him talking, at, you know, further in the sentencing. He is trying to save face. He is trying to deflect. He is trying to gaslight. Let's continue. Distributed, and I did not dismember that body, and there's a good reason for that, and I can explain that to you. Very good reason. I don't know that it's necessary. Okay. And, um, but it was done by the person that did this because he had medical experience. It was done by Schweikert and him. I stayed in front because it was a Saturday morning. There were people at my house in my neighborhood. People all stopped and said hello to each other. If I was in the back making noise, they would come back to find out if I was there, where I was. So I, homeowner, I stayed in the front with one of the other guys. And if anybody came along, I, I could say I'm having work done at my door. That is absolutely the most nonsense thing I've ever heard in my life. And again, the judge is not having a, this whole thing. Oh, well, they went in the back. Again, notice he's not doing this part. He is trying to make his remaining years as decent as they possibly can. That's his whole motivation for this. I cannot tell you how much what I hear from you infuriates me. I know it does. I can tell. And But I don't know. You're asking me to tell you the truth? I'm telling you the truth. Are there other homicide victims? Other than this evening, are there any other homicide victims that have died at your hands? No. I love the fact that the judge was so real and saying, I can't, and you can see it on his face and him saying, I can't tell you how much this infuriates me because it's what I feel too, not just this case, but many of them, when you're listening to the absolute carelessness for life and others life, obviously it's so senseless. And to hear him talking about this, like it's nothing like it is absolutely nothing. Now, mind you, it happened forever ago, right? But still, for him to recount this and to try and alleviate himself. Now, also notice the thing that he does in the conversation where the judge says, this is infuriating me. He goes, I know, I can tell, but you know, you wanted me to tell the truth, so I'm telling you. N these little verbal things, I don't know what you call it in that world, that like body language or language uh, you know, analysis or whatever, where he tries to take control of what I call information so like this. It's like this power move by Stephen where it's like, oh, I know it's infuriating you, but you, you know, you wanted to, you know, you wanted the truth. So he's acknowledging that it's an angry thing. I'm just like, well, it makes me angry too, you know, kind of a situation, right? It's like this, it's a power thing. It's a control thing. This is what he enjoys but I would argue that Stephen is an absolute coward. You know, this is, he gets off on other people's misery. I am going to accept his plea of guilty to these two charges at this time. Amen. Now we had this judge for another case and I cannot remember, and y'all drop it in the comments if you remember, but I remember absolutely loving him because he was very much like, hi, my name's judge. We dot the I's and we cross the T's. We start at eight and we do this and we run everything in a very orderly, mannerly way. And I just remember that. So when I saw him for this, I was like, this is the perfect judge to handle a monster like this. Now we've heard Steven's point of view, okay? Let's hear what a surviving victim has to say about his encounter with Steven. When you dropped his car off, did you all go inside the residence? We went inside, I believe he mentioned that he used the restroom. I followed him inside. So this gentleman, number one, bless his heart, being brave enough to get up here and share the story. It's scary and haunting to hear. Now what he's describing is he went out to a bar, 2606 I believe it was. He's looking for some friends. Steven's basically like, oh, I'm going to be going over to where they're at. You can follow me. You know, there, it's a party, but look, there's like a car situation. So we'll stop at my place. I have to use the bathroom. We'll drop a car off and then we'll go. And so they run inside. So that's the context right there. Let's continue. You expected to be stopping off at that residence temporarily before proceeding to a, a party. You said that you had some of your drink and that's about the last you remember. Yes. Do you remember what kind of drink it was? It's a glass of red wine. So they stop, they go in, he has a quick glass of wine while Stephen goes to do whatever. It has, you know, a substance in it that is going to be his demise for the evening. Were you conscious at least for some time there in the living room? Yes. Before the 
and at some point do you wake up? When I awoke, I did, at that time I didn't know where I was, but I was, I dumped him over my eyes and mouth. Can you imagine passing out? This is very Jeffrey Dahmer, okay? Very Jeffrey Dahmer. You pass out, you wake up, you have duct tape over your mouth and eyes, and you're bound up. I mean, this is a nightmarish event. Was there anything else that you could feel because you could not see? You said you had duct tape over your eyes. Could you feel anything else about your body and how you were positioned? Yes, I, I was, um, my, my arms and my legs were bound. I can also now that last part where his mic went out, I believe he said my mouth was covered up. So he wakes up, he's bound, all this type stuff. Now, again, when I'm hearing this story and I'm thinking to the story that Steven just told us about what went down with this kid and all this type stuff, this is more what I think probably happened, this type scenario of this, you know, I don't think it was as consensual as Steven makes it out to be, right? And another thing, too, with this whole dynamic going on, like with these two younger gentlemen versus, you know, this guy, Steven was, you know, doing that. This was a known thing that he did. He did this to, like, I think seven other known victims, right? Before he ended up taking the lives of two. And so once he hooked up with Scott, this was like a planned thing that they wanted to try and do. So while Steven's trying to make this out, like, oh, you know, th it was an accident, and then they did this, and they did this. I ain't buying it. And um, I would just recall his his face, if he didn't look the same. Um, there was no, nothing behind his eyes were dark. His face was contorted, which further panicked me. This whole thing of him becoming another person, I mean, that would be so scary. But then let's listen to this because this tells me even more what I need to know about Stephen, what he's about to say. I went from um, pleading which, are, which aroused him and then threatening and it seemed like that he didn't tolerate that as much as so we put that back over my eyes and mouth so I quickly learned not to threaten him. So that whole part where he said I was pleading, but that seemed to arouse him. I mean, that's the whole thing. He wasn't looking for a consensual between two partner situation. He wanted to do harm to somebody. That's what he enjoyed. He enjoyed that absolute fear. That is something completely different than someone engaging in like a consensual act of like, I've basically been drugged and kidnapped kind of a situation and assaulted, right? Completely different, right? And... If you notice what he does, and we're going to watch how he questions this guy in a second, like one quick clip of it, I'm just like, oh yeah, this is what he is. He is a predator. He let me know that other, he made other people disappear, and that would be my fate. And he's, and he's lucky to be alive. Now, let's watch a few clips of him questioning this guy, because remember, Stephen represents himself. Here we go. I've been hiding 29. I've answered that already. Yes. Um, in that chat that we had together did you mention that you were going to visit some of your friends no who were the friends that you were going to meet josie and Dwayne. do you know who josie and Dwayne were in the gay community as far as what did they do what the, was Josie and Dwayne the main drug dealers for Tampa? There's also this vibe with Steve when he's questioning him about this. Like, he almost still enjoys being like, I'm in the know. I know who the main suppliers are. You know what I mean? It comes off as so just creepy and unsettling. Did you go to the defendant's house to have sex with the defendant after we did some drugs at the bar? No. And look at that condescending smile that he offers him. But now watch this clip real quick and watch what he does. Mr. Lorenzo, may he be released? Uh, yes, sir. All right, thank you, sir. You may step down and may be released as a witness at this time. You're welcome. Had to ring that bell, calling him a liar. That's what he did. He mouthed, well, he said it to his lawyer, but I think they cut the mic off. But again, just that whole thing right there of like, I'm going to catch you up. I'm going to do this. And it's like, dude, the, I mean, it, it just, it blows my mind. And this is one of the things that I hate about seeing 
the perpetrators being able to question their victims, right? And number one, I just think it's like this narcissistic tirade that they go on and like one last thing to be able to have their last say or get back at people or control the environment. I don't know, but it's so gross. So now we're going to watch some clips of Stephen giving his rebuttal, his opening, whatever you want to call it. This is in, or this comes after the state did their opening arguments, or basically the state laying out. This is what we are arguing that happened on these evenings with these two gentlemen. And now Stephen is going to speak to this. That's a wonderful story. It's a very dramatic story, but it's a lie. It's a lie. Mr. Schweikert made up this story and I made it very, very clear in my 160-something page that he made it up to his peas, the state, because he was hoping he was going to walk from this case. Okay, so it's all a lie. It's very dramatic. Now, again, keep in mind, and we might have to take a damn shot for this one, y'all, how many times he says it doesn't bother him, but then he keeps going on about it, right? And you're just like, oh, but it does bother you. This is the thing with these narcissist-type personalities is they try and do this, but it's like they also wear on their shoulder completely what bothers them so he, so he was hoping that he could talk his way out of it and so he, he gave them the story that they wanted to hear and they conformed it with the fantasy role play chats that's fine i don't really care it doesn't bother me because the defense wants the death penalty and here we go in for the ask okay so it doesn't bother him. It's fine that they made all this up. Now, again, look at him trying to take power over it. Again, some of this could be just trying to save face, right? I would not want to be like, I'm going to go down to lock up after all this has been aired. Mind you, he has been locked up for a while, but nonetheless, with these type crimes, right? It's just, I can't imagine it's safe, whatever. Whatever narcissistic, sociopathic reason he has for trying to save face on this, there's that. But then he goes in for the, the defense wants this. So he's trying to take away the power that they have over that, right? Now I'll get into my opinions at the end of this about him asking for the death penalty, all that kind of stuff, but let's keep watching for now. The defense is saying, yes, give me the death penalty. That is absolutely great. Again, hear him. That's absolutely great. And look at the hand motions, the reaching out to the judge, all this type of stuff. I mean, he does put on a good show, if you will. Um, I'm sure this judge sees right through it. Let's continue. That's exactly what I want. I'm 64 years old. It can take, I could be on death row for 10, 15 years. The comfort set they get in the death row are a lot more comfortable than it is in the federal system. You get your own private cell, you get your own TV, you get your own computer, you get all this stuff. But your privacy, your daily quality of life privacy, at my age, is, is invaluable. The fact that he would get up there and say this openly to the judge and in front of people is a spit in the victims and their families' faces. I'm just like... I mean, this shows you how his mind works. This is a level of selfishness that is just, you know, I don't want to say unseen because we watch it all the time in these cases that we watch here, right? Also notice the um, the cop, the guard, the bailiff, whatever you call the gentleman sitting behind him. We're going to have to start like something with these dudes who have to sit there, the, the guards, with this straight poker face listening to this absolute nonsense coming from them. Because you can tell when he starts doing this, you can just feel it. He's like, oh my. Like what? I mean, the same thing we're all thinking. I'm going to be, I have a life sentence in the feds. I'm going to uh, be in, the, in prison for the next 10 or 15 years until I ne normally would normally die anyway. I could be in the state for 10 or 15 years before they even get to me. I can possibly pass on before I can get there, but I want to be comfortable. I want to do my time my way. It's easy time. That right there, I want to do my time, my way, it's easy time. I might might make that the, the damn title to the thing. It's so disturbing. But you see where I'm going. I was like, I, I, I just... I, I don't know what to say about it. It's infuriating. And note this judge, the little bit we know about him, you know he has to be sitting there just cracking his knuckles underneath that bench. And what the best the state can do is give me euthanasia. And that's how I see it. It's euthanasia. It's by choice. That's what I want to do. So I'm not arguing with the state. So what I'm going to let the state, I'm going to do my basic um, uh, objections to certain things to keep things fair and balanced for the Supreme Court because I, I know what's going there, and that's fine. But um, I'm really not going to try to counter 
they have false claims. That's a false claim. They're twisting the facts. They're twisting it all around. And you know, that's, that's their job to do it. That's fine. Again, he's sitting there, he's trying to take the power away from everyone around him by claiming it. I want this, I want this, therefore you can't do it to me because I'm asking for it, right? When he's like euthanasia or whatever, I'm like, and I, cause I said, let's just, let's go ahead. Cause I can't wait to the end of the video. Okay. So if it was me and it was like, I don't care if I was 20 years old and they're like, you're going to be in here for multiple life sentences. I'd be like, just send me all sparky. I mean, a hundred percent. Right. So I'm not going to lie. I would want, I would want to want to sit in jail for the rest of my life. I say that now, but I don't know. Maybe when you're in there, it would be like, I don't know. I think it would be horrible um, to like look at a whole lifetime of that. Right. So, I just think that he has different reasons for it. Now he does make some sense in that, oh, this is gonna take years and this and the other, but to sit here and say the things like, so my time will be easy, he can't be that stupid. Part of me wonders, does he want the life sentence? Because I would almost guarantee you that what he would be saying to his little peeps behind, you know, when he gets back down there is like, see, I told you, I reverse psychology them and I got what I wanted and I escaped the death penalty. That's also a narrative that I could see happening. But I'm not gonna counter it because I want this court to make me think I'm the worst thing on two feet. I want them to con sit, con con continue sit fat because the more they think I'm the bad guy, the more further I'm going to the chance I'm going to get the death penalty. So I'm not going to try to argue that. I'm not going to try to counter it even though it's so twisted, it is, I'm beside myself. So you hear him going up there, I'm not going to try and counter that. He has said multiple times that it's lies, right? He cannot leave that alone. He is bent over it. Now, the fact that he's like, I want the court to make me think that I'm this really awful person. Honey, you did that yourself, okay? By number one, your actions. But number two, I mean, just furthering the point here of getting up here and doing this. It's just like, what? Are you kidding me? But because, but I expect that. I put in what exactly happened that night. I'm that document. I did that on purpose because I knew this was coming. And I'm, I'm, I'm not going to sit there and argue and try to change it because I want you to believe it. Go ahead, believe it. I, that's fine. I have no problem with that. But I want you to see what really transpired because that is fair to let you know exactly what happened. Now this whole thing of I want you to believe it. I want you to do this. Even if we took his story, the little blips that we've heard of what he's seen happen, I'm just like, are you crazy? That's still horrible. It's still horrible, even though I don't believe that's how it happened at all, right? I think he is completely lying. And the fact that he is gonna get up here and say these things just feeds into the type of monster that he is. This is someone who even decades later is still saying this. This dude has no empathy. This man is a complete psychopath, sociopath, narcissist. Now, I ain't no doctor, nothing like that to do any official diagnoses. These are coming from the sofa, okay? But nonetheless, let's let the evidence speak for itself. I mean, my God. Okay, so, so now we're doing a little bit of a time warp. Uh, we are now gonna be talking about the actual sentencing. So I had to basically wait on them to come back and do the sentencing and so that's what we're doing. He didn't cease to amaze us even there, right? He kept going, but the judge wasn't having it. So let's keep watching some clips and talking about it. Okay, very good. I'd like to take me about five or seven minutes of your time if you don't Well, I, I will uh, ask that you try to summarize it as quickly as possible. Okay, okay. First off, I'd like to thank Mr. Gonzalez, Mr. Sonority, and everybody else. That was part of the defense team. They were absolutely incredible, absolutely incredible. And I want to thank them from the bottom of my heart. Thank you. Can I address the state attorney? You may. Yes. I'd like to uh, let you guys know that I have no animosity against you. You did your job, and you did a very good job of prosecuting this case. So I want to thank you for that, because I appreciate your fairness to me. And that's what I appreciate. In this lifetime, I'm the bad guy, you're the good guy. Maybe the next lifetime the role will be re reversed, who knows. But I want to let you know that I uh, wish you all well. Yeah, 100% doesn't wish them well. Absolutely not. Like that was even a thing, right? Now let's first of all talk about the very beginning where it's like he goes into some kind of like Academy Award thank you speech. And what I find so interesting about personality types like him, Daryl Brooks was this way, he's this way, 
it's, it's like they have to have the last word, but also it's like a form of control. He is so out of control in this situation, being sentenced, all the stuff, you know, having literal control over, you know, I have to ask to go to the bathroom. I'm in handcuffs the whole nine yards. So it's like he is absolutely trying to take control over every last detail. Can I talk to, you know, can I say a few words? Well, let me thank them and do this. And then when he turned to the prosecution, you could see his demeanor change, right? It was like he was trying his best to just muster up this level. And then he has to slide in the whole thing. In this lifetime, I was the bad guy. And maybe, you know, and you were the good guy. Maybe that will change next lifetime. They always have to slide in this, like, religious, spiritual superiority type thing. Which literally defeats the purpose of that anyways. So it gets worse. So let's keep watching. And to the judge, I want to thank you because you have uh, had incredible tolerance and patience and fairness to me uh, while I stumbled my way through this whole process. And I want to appreciate that. I want you to know that. And I want that on the record for the Florida Supreme Court. So I'd like that to be there. Um, now you can also see he sounds nervous and looks nervous, but he's also kind of got this thing going on that I personally think beneath this he is scared to death, right? Because remember he's been up here like, I want the death penalty. It'll be easiest for me. It'll be easier on this. I think he's scared to death to get it. You know, <laughs> I mean, I just think that's what it is at the end of the day, right? Uh, but let's keep going. I'm seeking the death penalty. It's in my best interest, basically because um, it's a comfort, it's mine. I'll be living a lot more comfortable than I would in the federal system, living on death row, believe it or not. And, uh, and of course, that may sound selfish, but I've lived in a private cell for the last five years, and I'm going to have a private cell on death row. At my age, I want to be comfortable. I want my privacy. That's what I want. So that's what I'm doing. It may sound selfish, but that's the way it is. You live for today. You don't live for the past. You live for today. Now, this is the other thing where he's going back into asking for, you know, his creature comforts of what he wants in the sentence. Now, I also think it's like a last minute jab because I think he knows what he's getting, right? I think he knows he's going to have the book thrown at him. And it's like this last minute grab at trying to control it. Like, I want what you're about to give me. You know, it doesn't have any power over me. I want it. I want it. I want my own cell and that's what I'm going to get if you give this to me. And honestly, it's repulsive. So I'm asking you to give me the death sentence because that'll be more comfortable for me to live out my lifetime. I know I can be on death row for about 10 to 15 years, which I think is crazy. But um, uh, as far as I see it, it's just euthanasia. I already have a death sentence. Everybody in this room has a death sentence. So as far as I'm concerned, you're just offering me a euthanasia that I'm looking to do willingly. That's all it really comes down to. I mean, he is begging to be thrown in that briar patch, right? And the whole thing about everybody in this room has a death sentence. You know, I mean, I'm just, I'm asking for it. You're giving me something. I'm doing it willingly. I mean, this dude cannot stand to be like told what to do. Or I can't imagine what he's like on a day-to-day -day basis in, in uh, confinement, right? Like the jailers and stuff like that dealing with him. He must be a, a nightmare. And so I'm asking you to do that. So, uh, and I'm gonna try to speed up this process so I don't have to wait 15 years because I got better things to do in my time. The sooner that I uh, uh, get euthanized, as far as I'm concerned, the faster I can get, the sooner I can get, fetch myself a new body and come back again, a fresh body. That's how I look at it because that's how it is. That's how it's spiritual work. We're eternal beings. I mean, I, I just, I can't, right? It's like, he is so hard trying to throw every reason to the judge to give him life in prison, right? He wants the judge to give him life in prison, in my opinion. Yet this whole thing of like the quicker I can go get another body and come back down. I mean, I, it has to be all this judge can do to sit up there and just make it through this. You know, it, the entire thing, it's groveling. It is disgusting. This is a small man. I bet you he wasn't this whatever 
when he was taking the lives and abusing and attacking all these innocent people, right? Um, when he was in control. I mean, he was a complete monster. That's what he was. That's who he is at his core. But the monster can't stand to have the tables turned. And I don't know if uh, what you say is uh, perhaps some form of reverse psychology, no. nor do I care. I will not consider what you want in issuing my sentence. I know that. Yes. All right. So I am then ready to proceed. Did you have anything else that you want to say? No, I'm pretty good. I'm looking forward to getting this over with. It's been five long years. Yeah. All right. I mean, I wanted to give the judge a standing ovation. He was thinking what everybody's thinking and watching this. It's just like, is this reverse psychology? Because I, I really think that's what it is. I mean, I just, I do. I just, I, it drives me crazy. But notice the guy can't even shut up during that. He's like, thank you. I'm ready to get this over with. He has to constantly try and verbally maneuver and one up. Just such a useless human being, right? I'm like, oh my gosh. This guy is just unfixable, okay? It, it, it take away what he's done, the horrible things he's done to these young men um, and countless others. It's just, it's a vile person. In the words of Miss Pam Williams, from one Italian to another, Tifandano a morte. That translates to, I sentence you, Mr. Lorenzo, to death. That is the punishment that you deserve Thank you. for these horrific crimes. My reasoning is explained in a 40 page order that I have prepared and signed and am filing contemporaneous with this sentence. It will be handed out to the defense and the state now. Woo! The judge is pissed, okay? And I don't blame him. You hear Stephen right back there, thank you. You know, I'm just like, oh my God. I mean, again, it just runs all over me. And I love the way that the, the mic drop moment that the judge had with this or whatever. Uh, because then he's right. It's what he deserves. You know what I'm saying? Up here trying to make it like you want to be more comfortable. Trust me. I know. And again, I've said this before. And I think that's the beginning of this video where I was like, look, if I was going to be, you know, facing life and all this type of stuff, I'd probably beg for the chair too. I mean, trust me. I get it. On the same note, death row in Florida, I mean, come on, right? This isn't a cute look. This is not a pretty place he's going to be going. He's probably pretty comfortable where he's at and has gotten used to that for however long. And so it's probably a pretty scary feat to think of, oh my goodness, I'm going to be going to the the worst of the worst the the most torrid place where there are no rules right i don't know how it works in uh, florida's death row specifically um but i would imagine if there was a place that you were going to be victimized to some level it would be this thank you all very much thank you God. I and it. mr lorenzo may god have mercy on your soul my soul is fine thank you sir and you notice how when he was like Thank you, Your Honor. I appreciate it. It's like a different vibe, right? Like, it's almost like he's scared or he's jolted. I, again, I do not believe that the man really wanted the death sentence. And then he's like, my soul is fine. I'm like, no, it's not. It's completely broken, okay? So I hope that with this, finally, the victims' families, the victims, the survivors, are able to get some sense of true, like, <sighs> closure right i hope that he sticks to his word and facilitates the um you know the appeals and all that type of stuff so that he can get to be euthanized sooner so that the victims survivors all these people they don't have to continue to have this garbage in their life right uh, and have to go to court and do this and do that and so on and so forth i mean at the end of the day it is true i mean he he ain't no spring chicken right and just like he said i mean look at how long it takes if you sit here and say i'm ready to go take me to the chair it still takes years for this to happen i mean heaven knows if you try and fight it right he could very well just die of natural causes in jail or prison um so yeah but i mean that's the thing i mean this man terrorized numerous people's lives 
who knows how many people never spoke out, right? And that's how people like him operate because he's a coward. Um, and so is his little co-defendant too. And his co-defendant too. Anyways, if you're still watching, drop hearts in the comments for those that didn't survive this monster, those that did, and the victim's parents and the bravery of them for getting up there and fighting for justice for their sons for this whole time. It takes a lot to do that and I commend them for that. And also Roscoe says thank you for hanging out on the sofa with him for this long. I know it was kind of a long video, but until we pull the ring light out and get Roscoe on the sofa and put my signature little black t-shirt on, I'll see y'all soon.